What's up, Warriors, and welcome to another episode of the Mental Health Movement Podcast, Voice for the Voiceless. I am your host, Chris, and today we have a very special guest with us today. Um, she is one of the admins of our Mental Health Movement page. She is one of my dear friends, and she's going to help me uh, cover today's topic, which is Autism Acceptance Month. Uh, please welcome Kate. Caitlin, how are you today? I'm good. I'm so happy to be here. This is exciting. Yeah, I, I greatly appreciate you coming on. Um, I know we t talked about this for a little while, trying to get you on and wanted to make sure you were comfortable with whatever was covered and didn't want to put you in like a, a stressful spotlight. So I'm really happy that you uh, decided to come on for this one. Yeah, I'm really grateful that like you worked with me for a few weeks on this too and making sure that like I could be prepared because I overthink everything and not the best uh, social speaker. Right. Yeah. No worries. Um, like I like I told you before, I definitely want to guide you through this the best that I can to my ability and make sure that you're comfortable with everything. And, you know, I think it'll be a great session. So I'm really excited to, uh, to talk with you. Yeah. Um, all right. So the very first question that I had for you, and I thought this was a very important question to start off with uh, simply because it was something that I learned from you, actually, that I wanted to get your thoughts on. So awareness versus acceptance. What is it about the phrasing of acknowledging this month you feel is the most important? Does awareness create a stigma for those who are diagnosed with autism? I mean, kind of. Um, I can't speak for everybody else who is autistic, but I do have enough friends where we've all come together and learned a lot of stuff about ourselves and I remember like when we were younger, we were classified more in like the um, mentally handicapped kind of classes and stuff. And it just seems weird that, you know, we're also the same ones who evolved more into the honors and AP classes. So the awareness thing to me just makes it seem like it's a disease, like it's something that needs a cure very desperately. And that's not what it is. Um there's a lot of times where people find out that I'm autistic or my son is and they end up saying some kind of apology and they'll be like, I couldn't tell. You seem so smart and in control of yourself. And I'm like, yeah, I am. Because, you know, being on the spectrum is actually just so wildly normal. Um, I feel like most people are on the spectrum at some point. And it's just crazy because it's just so commonly misunderstood and belittled. Like I had told you before that it's constant backhanded compliments. I mean, there's like, there's a company, the one that has like the puzzle pieces that I'm just learning about too. And they provide terrible information and mistreatment. They have programs to kind of get rid of it and make it seem like it's so terrible and while awareness is a great thing to have, it still implies a stigma because like acceptance and education would be a better way to go about it. Everyone's right. aware of autism, but no one really educates themselves enough in order to accept it. Yeah, and you know, it's, a, it's a great point you made about the, the AP and honors and then like the special needs class and everything when while in the same breath you're saying, you know, autism is is it's normal you know it's not something that people should be walking up to you saying oh my god I'm sorry you're dealing with that or I'm sorry Zane's dealing with that it shouldn't be like that it should be just as normal as anything else and I definitely feel uh, like what you said um, when it comes to people trying to understand mental illnesses or understand any kind of disorders there's always that stigma of we uh, whether you know um let's let's create this month and let's create awareness but that awareness doesn't come with acceptance and education it's just oh well there's people out there that have autism and that's it and you know that's kind of how i feel about uh you know other other months of the year too when it comes to um disorders or when it comes to uh, mental health stuff it's just like it's just a hashtag it shouldn't just be a hashtag on social media it should come with like you said acceptance it should come with that education and uh, when I sent you that, uh, that image a couple of weeks ago, um, about, you know, autism, uh, acceptance and everything, I had no idea about 
the puzzle piece thing. I genuinely had no ill intentions towards it. And when you told me about it, I was just like, okay, this is a, uh, this is a time where I need to educate myself and understand why you felt the way that you felt. And while there's always an understanding between you and I, when it comes to that kind of stuff, and I'm always willing to learn and um, create dialogue about, about things like this. I'm really glad that you put me, I don't want to say put me in my place because it wasn't a, it wasn't a negative interaction. It was just more so you wanted me to educate myself on the subject. Yeah, I actually always appreciated that about you, too, that you can always just have a conversation and it never turns into an argument. It's like you're always just willing to be enlightened. Right. And that's I wish more people would be like that instead of just wanting to stay in their own little bubble of me. Yeah, if it doesn't affect you, it doesn't matter kind of mentality. Yeah, and it's just like, you know, you should talk to, if you love people enough, you should understand that really some, um, there's going to be a few people that have autism and that might not even know it. So it's always best to just kind of learn it so you know how to talk to your loved ones. Yeah, and you know, that chart that you shared in the group, uh, I think it was last month you shared it of the the links between autism and a bunch of different personality disorders it was very enlightening to to read some of those uh, personality traits and autism traits because like you said it's it's a normal it, it should be treated as normal it shouldn't be you know uh, I guess put people in that like box of oh well you have autism so we're going to put you in your own month and we're going to just pretend like we're creating awareness while we're not going to educate on people what autism <laughs> is and how normal it is for people to have. Yeah, it, once you learn so much about it, it just ends up being like, there's so many of my friends that saw those on my personal page too, and they were like, oh, wow, so really my entire personality is sponsored by autism. I'm like, it could be. <laughs> it's normal. Right. It's just, I mean, it's just a different way of thinking. It just means that maybe you hit milestones at a different time than other people, but we're not supposed to be comparing our milestones to others anyway. Absolutely. And I definitely think that's another uh, another thing that many people have uh, problems with is the comparison, uh, comparison trait that I feel like a lot of us as human beings have. And it's, it's always hard to, uh, I guess, have dialogue with somebody who might have that personality disorder and them either not knowing it or not educated enough to know why they feel the way that they feel but like you said we shouldn't be comparing milestones anyway yeah it, we shouldn't people, be it's not healthy yeah um all right so the next question i had was um i guess it was it's linked towards both you and zane so when you had zane i know you eventually had him tested for autism and was this when you decided to get yourself tested as well? Um, Kind of. So I guess in some way, I was told as a child that I was on the spectrum. We just didn't know back in like the 90s and early 2000s really what that meant. I right. knew I had ADHD. I knew I had OCD. I knew I had um, klutziness and um, a lot of stuff. Auditory processing disorder was one that I kept forgetting because, funny enough, it was spoken to me and I didn't process it because it was a mm -hmm. lot of stuff. But when um, you take your child in when they're little and you do frequent checkups and they they started noticing signs that, you know, he was hitting his milestones a little further behind than other kids, but then also in other areas at an accelerated rate, like he taught himself how to play the piano just because he couldn't, he was playing with the piano and just liked certain melodies and remembered, oh, this is how you hear it when you hear Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. So he figured out how to teach himself how to play that song. Wow. And when he was very little, I want to say about like a year or so, they were thinking that he is on the spectrum or he's ADHD, which really ADHD is on the spectrum. So that seems silly. But 
Um, they were like, he could be autistic or he could be ADHD and a little naughty. <laughs> but he is a little, but you, you've met him. He's so sweet. Yeah. And yeah, it was looking like he needed to have some speech therapy. And that moved forward to my best friend told me that it's very clear as day to her because she's very educated in this area that I have autism. She said that she would bet it's Asperger's and I am immature and laughed at it because you know how it sounds. Yeah. And yeah, when we went to go better himself, I was like, well, I'm not going to consider it as bettering himself. I already think he's amazing. I need to better myself and I need to know how to help him the best way I can. So we both got evaluated together and it's still an ongoing process and it just helps us learn how to communicate with each other so we can help each other move forward and, you know, advance on to more things. How does, um, how does testing for autism work? Like, how do they go about testing for that? I, I truly don't understand it. It feels like a normal conversation a lot of times. Right. But then they give you like activities too. And then they give you some things to read. And they ask you, like, how you perceive this and how would you go about handling this kind of situation? What are the steps that you would take? And it's just, I can't wrap my head around it, but I do think that the way that they test you is relaxing and they're just trying to learn all these different things and they'll throw in random things too so you stay calm and they just some places are just very very good about making sure that you do know that there's nothing wrong with you good yeah i i definitely i think that would be my biggest uh not really fear but more so that would be something that i would want for my child or for myself if i was on the spectrum to make sure that i was comfortable and make sure my child is is comfortable because i definitely feel that there's people in, you know, just the mental health field in general that are just kind of like don't have patience for people or aren't willing to make sure you're comfortable enough to, uh, I guess, either share about yourself or I guess diagnose what you're, uh, what you might may or may not have. Yeah, people like that just don't belong in the field. If you're not, in order to work with any kind of mental health, you do need to have patience and empathy and a good personality and you need to have some kind of desire to help other people. Otherwise you, it's just um, an empty title. Right. I, I don't remember if you told me or not. Um, did you say that you had to go to like multiple therapists for, for you and Zane to try and uh, I guess like help him with the learning process and everything? Absolutely. We we're still in finding different places because the, um, you know, most insurances don't cover anything that we need, like neurologists, and we need to be able to go through certain paths with neurologists before we can move forward into actual, like, workshop therapy. And it's just so difficult because then there's so many wait lists, too, and they make you jump through all these different hoops to get in. And it's just complicated. Well, I mean, we've been dealing with this for... Um, I want to say this is like our third state, you know, it was Arizona and now we're, then it was Louisiana and now it's here. And it just seems like it's, it should be so much easier to be able to get in. It should be as accessible as going to a gym to have some kind of mental health help. Absolutely. And it's, it's crazy to me that there isn't, you know, more help available because, you know, again, you would think with, with uh, April being the month that it is, you know, again, and I hate to say it's a hashtag, that's how society I feel like is treating it. It's, they're not like actively mm -hmm. trying to make sure that people with autism have more help. And it's, it bothers me so much that, like you said, that insurance is making you jump through hoops. I mean, I, I just, that's completely messed up. Yeah, it is messed up. That's what I also don't think that like, well, I think it's a sweet 
gesture on some way that I can't understand yet. I'm just trying to understand it. I think the awareness thing is great, but I don't see any anywhere. Right. I see that I'm trying to make everyone aware, but that's an everyday thing, not the month of April. Right. Yeah. And, you know, that's that's how I feel about, uh, you know, just like mental health month or just men's mental health in general. Um, you know, it shouldn't be just stricken to one month. It shouldn't be one month out of the entire year. It should be every single day. And it should be every single day. Men yeah. face such toxic issues throughout, I don't even know, all over the place. And that's also something that should be every single day. It shouldn't just be certain disorders. It should be like, hey, maybe everyone should be able to get some help and maybe everyone should be kind of treated in the same way because we all have brains. So if we yeah. all have brains, then they all need to have proper protocols and just be kind. Yeah, definitely. It's weird to hear that. Out of today's world is kindness. Yeah, and I, I don't see it a whole lot. So it's really important to me to try to do it. Sometimes it's difficult, but I have a little one watching and I want him to be kind. Yeah. I'm sure it's hard uh, staying positive for not only yourself, but for him as well and not let the world get to you like it does to us. You know what I mean? Um, it's It's such a hard hard part of our lives right now where we're trying so hard to uh you know spread acceptance and spread awareness of certain things and um just trying to i guess essentially let make the world listen to us yeah yeah because i'm gonna keep i'm gonna keep sharing as much as i possibly can and i'm just gonna have all those conversations as much as i can because it is just so nice to learn about yourself. Yeah. And when you learn things that you're on the spectrum and then you learn all these really cool things that you used to be ashamed of, but you're then somehow learning about it makes you proud of yourself. And that's like really important. Everyone should have something that they feel proud of themselves for. Absolutely agree. Um how does how does uh how challenging does autism make coping with uh any of the other mental illnesses that you may struggle with like is there you know i know you were saying it's normal and i don't mean to put it in a box with that with that question if that's how it came off but just oh no does it make any of your other mental health struggles more challenging now that you know you struggle or not struggle now that you know that you're diagnosed with autism it's kind of like um a yes and a no thing. I have very bad coping skills. It's because I was taught verbally and I'm I'm one of those people that kind of needs to be able to actively work on something while seeing somebody else do it so I learn how to do it. But when you're taught as a child or even in therapy how to cope with things, that's usually just words. And I have a hard time understanding what people are saying um would need to kind of hear it again and again and then ask a bunch of questions so I can try to create my own visual cues and then there's other areas where I don't know how to accept certain things mm. because I don't really understand how it is that I'm feeling about it I don't understand how I'm supposed to stop feeling that way about it and then there's a lot of times too where I like obsessively try to figure out how to return to a routine because my routine is my religion and right. certain things upset me and they break my routine. And then I kind of obsessively try to figure my way back into that while feeling those bad things. The bad things kind of just shatter the way that I do everything because I don't know how to function anymore. And then the downside, too, is that sometimes it creates codependencies. And I don't know if you feel codependent towards people ever, but it puts like way too much pressure on certain things to where you think that those people are almost like your glasses. Like, I can't see without you, but 
you kind of need to figure out how to see without those people. That's not fair to them. Right. Um, so the codependent part, um, I used to be that way where I constantly needed to have people, you know, uh, I guess I needed to be glued to like, for example, Alyssa, um, I was friends with her for 11 years. Uh, we bonded over wrestling. We bonded over everything. And I constantly had to do everything with her approval. Like, not like I had to ask her permission for anything like that, but more so I had to, you know, change myself to, I guess, get acceptance of her friendship. And I was, whenever her and I stopped being friends, it destroyed me for so long. And in one year, I've always had friends say, she's no good for you. You know, she's a leech and she's, she's this and she's that. And then there's the other part of me where it's like, well, man, I miss having somebody to talk to about wrestling. I miss sharing my heart and my passions with somebody who at the time I thought gave a shit. And right. when that friendship came to an end, it threw me off for so many years that I didn't know who the hell the person I was in the mirror because I changed everything about myself for one person who didn't give a shit. And yeah, I've had that with somebody before too. And I had many people, actually everybody in my life tell me that they were terrible to me. And I think the part with codependencies and autism is that those people may be treating you terribly, but you're so used to them and then it's your routine. And that was like just the person that you went to for all these different things. So you accept all of this abuse because what are you even without them at this point that would have to change every single thing in your life? Right. And that's exactly. kind of hard to just accept. And I remember I was one, of, I wanted to be one of those people that I admired. So I wanted to be one of those people that just cut the ties and would be like, you know, even if my voice shakes, I'm going to say it because it needs to be said. And even if it hurts, I'm going to end this because one day it won't hurt anymore. And I need to focus on that. And those are really hard things to do, especially when you have, I don't, it's not even just if you're autistic, it's just if you're lonely and codependent and you know, you love these people, so yeah. you want them to love you. And it's just so sickening and hurtful to see and know that they don't love us back. Yeah. And it's the, the hardest part of that, too, is when you realize that that person could have been your trauma bond for so many years because you didn't feel that love from a parent and you thought that person loved you uh, <laughs> all those years just to find yes. out that it was the complete opposite. That was actually exactly how it started, too. Yeah. It was and trauma bonding, yes. And when, when me and her first became friends, that's when I started doing things for her. You know, I brought alcohol to school for her one time and put it in a water bottle. Like, I... Classic. <laughs> <laughs> um, she stayed at my house because her mom called the cops on her, and we basically hid her away for two days. And, you know, I oh. I did so much for her. And... I I wish I could say I'd take it back, but I probably I probably wouldn't have taken it back because it was, you know, we had some good times together. Yeah. I'm not gonna say that it was perfect the whole time, but um we had good times and it was a decent friendship for what I thought it was anyway. Um but you know, grief grief is very tricky to deal with because people underestimate how how heavy grief can hit somebody. Yeah, honestly, some people feel it worse and feel yeah. it longer and feel it harder. And I think that might have to do with some kind of coping disorder. I don't know. I'm, I'm We're always going to be learning. Right. Um. So the next question I had for you, Um. have you and Zane ever done like any kind of therapy together? Like, uh, I guess, ways to help him understand certain things uh, better, like through verbal or nonverbal skills? Yes, we have, we do so many things together every day, all day. It's really because it's been so challenging to find assistance with it. I remember when he was about a year and a half old and we, I 
put in all this hard work and jump through all these hoops to get him a speech therapist. But then I had to teach the speech therapist how to get him to talk because she didn't know him and he wasn't going to communicate the way that she was expecting him to. And I thought that was crazy for her to be a speech therapist and know that he is on the spectrum and not know or even try. So it's just been me and him for the most part doing things. We will, I just pay attention to who he is and what he likes and what he learned best with. And that is his uh, music. He is the most musical person I've ever met. And I love that about him. So when we play songs, he gets to associate certain things like this is a bus and these are colors. And, you know, I'll be like, if you want to listen to music, let's try to do these things, you know, and we'll turn learning how to read into songs, too. So, I mean, he may not be speaking like other kids his age and he may not be doing certain things he should be but I mean, he taught himself how to play the piano man right. and he can read and I love and his father today I was like you know because his father works a lot and I have him with us um or not us but with myself at the office all day so his father misses out on certain things and he hates it so I try to show him these milestones he's hitting like he makes his own food now and I don't have to yeah I don't have to do much so I'll like hold something for him so he doesn't spill it he's so funny about spilling stuff it's ridiculous but um he will um yeah make his own food and I'll tell him what numbers to press on the microwave if he's using the microwave and then you know, I'll be like, hit start. And he looks and he spells it and then hits the button. Nice. And it's different on all microwaves and he's still doing it. That's incredible. And yeah, he looked at this sign. No pictures, no nothing. He just saw the word chicken and he started asking for chicken nuggets. And I was like, <laughs> the fact that you can read before you can speak is hilarious to me. That's incredible. Yeah, and he can do math, and it's actually getting to be a little embarrassing, and I think he's going to have to teach me math in a couple of years. Because <laughs> I've watched him do, he I mean, he just turned four, and he's already doing multiplication and division. What? Yeah, I know. So wow. that's what I'm saying. It's just, it's just a different way of thinking. Yeah. I definitely, uh, every time I, I see, like, a story about an autistic kid and the things that they can do, again it should be so normal because these these kids and adults are just so incredible and you look at a guy like uh i think it's i think elon i believe he's autistic i'm not 100 percent. i think he's on the spectrum um if i remember correctly but look at how successful he is and there, there's so many successful people that are on the spectrum and it blows my mind that there's so many people at that level that uh, I guess don't really like push the message that autism is so normal because yeah, you said Zane just turned four. Yeah, he just turned four. That is, that is outrageously incredible. I, wow. Yeah, I mean, my I think my uncle is also on the spectrum. He didn't mm. speak until he was four at all, but yeah. he is in California. And he's like a millionaire, a multimillionaire. Wow. He's got a bunch of Teslas and um, he's like, yeah, like this engineering CEO kind of dude. So, I mean, people can try to say that autism might make you dumb or something, but I'm not seeing it. I think that autism is like this kind of cool superpower where you can yeah. be hyper-focused and it's what ignites like this intense amazing passion right i definitely think it's uh i agree with the superpower thing (laughs) that's just incredible to me that little dude is doing multiplication and division and stuff at four years old what the heck (laughs) yeah i don't even remember about about it (laughs) um what is the most important lesson that you've learned about um about your um being diagnosed with autism that you try to teach Zane like is there anything specific that you yourself try to teach him 
about autism? Um, I mean, I know he's only four, but. Yeah, no, but it's, yeah, absolutely. Because I teach him, we don't actually talk about autism. Okay. Because we don't need to. It doesn't need to be something that is put on him in such a negative way, like it was put on me as a child. So I, because I was put in the, these special classes and these like lower level intermediate classes, um, and then I was like so far behind in like the reading, remember the grade level reading that they would test us on? Mm. I was so far behind and I felt so embarrassed and ashamed and I was always calling myself stupid and I wasn't, it was just, I was stuck in an environment where people didn't know how to work with me so mm-hmm. I know how to work with him I have learned how to do that and the things that I try to teach him are actually the things that he taught me because knowing that he is also autistic but I can see how brilliant and amazing he is I try to teach him that to just like embrace your weirdness because yeah you are just so awesome and brilliant and amazing. And I really don't think there's anything that he can't do. And it's so silly because I should have been talking to myself like that too, but it took him to teach that about me. Now I just think that we're like the coolest people ever. Yeah. And you know, it, it kind of goes back to what I, what I try saying to you, like, you know, with the whole texting thing or messaging thing, I always try to say, I'm like, listen, like, I understand you have a lot going on. You have your routines and you have the things that you're focused on. And, you know, I know it's like a, we joke around about it with, you know, Jason and Mm -hmm. Brian and everything. But to me, I, I always feel like there needs to be that high level of understanding. Like, listen, like, you know, you have this, this, and this going on outside of just working, you know, it's, you have a lot of, uh, you have a lot of blocks in place that you're trying to build over your foundation and, you know, one step to the left or one step to the right, it could, uh, you know, send you spiraling or send you, uh, I guess, down that rabbit hole of, of, uh, I guess, trying to catch back up to your, um, routine, like you were saying about hyper-focus earlier. Um, and I kind of, I want to ask this. So do you feel that labeling like just in general you know whether it's autistic whether it's uh depression or whatever do you think labels are harmful to to kids or i guess to even adults you know i feel like it i feel like people put such an unnecessary pressure on labeling things Mm -hmm. i understand that things need to have a definition to it but the world is never going to be black and white and There needs to be, instead of everyone focusing on labels and making certain things trendy, like depression is not trendy, OCD is not trendy, autism is not trendy. So stop saying these labels for attention and just, you know, pick up a book or pick up the phone and call somebody and ask questions because there are a lot of people out there because everyone's over using these labels Mm -hmm. there's no real education about these things so there are people who could actually have something severe and no one's going to help them no one's going to walk with them and guide them out of this dark place because everyone's just using it to get attention now and or they have been even when we were kids and you know, these people can end up being in real danger because of that kind of stuff. Agreed. I, I definitely feel like, uh, I, I like to call them buzzwords. Like, you know, uh, turning the clock back five years ago, how many times a day did we hear gaslighting? Pretty much never. And now we hear it almost every single day. And yeah. obviously, you and I both know what gaslighting is. We have been gaslit probably our, our entire lives. Um, yes. Yeah. I don't feel the need to say it every single day. I don't feel the need to share with people every single day that I I have depression or whatever. I don't feel the need to constantly have to put a label inside every single sentence that I say to people. Like if I'm sharing my story in the group or on one of these podcasts, 
I'm going to say what I went through, but I'm not going to say, oh, well, it's because of depression. Like, no, it's because of circumstances and because of a traumatic event. I'm not going to say uh, depression, love bombing, <laughs> uh, gaslighting, you know, whatever buzzword is, like you said, trendy of the week. And I feel yeah. that's why there's so much stigma behind mental health, behind mental illness and behind mental health struggles because of those buzzwords. You know, it's great to let people know what gaslighting is, right? And it's great to share with people what autism is through education and so on and so forth. But like you said, everybody is making it a trendy thing. It's going to stay in that box of being stigmatized every single day. Yeah. And honestly, I just feel like definitions are more important than the word itself. Facts. Meaning like an understanding is more important than the label. So when you overuse things, like I was just speaking with Derek, one of our newer but bigger members, he, um, we were just talking about this too, where I was saying that narcissism is being overused Facts. and gaslighting is being overused and the terms of abuse are being overused and they're not really being understood. And I'm going to say a curse word, just so you know, but no, go for it. I mean, just because this person is being manipulative doesn't mean they're actually gaslighting you. They're just being manipulative. There is still a difference. And just because this person is an asshole doesn't mean that he's a narcissist or she's a narcissist. Just right. means that they're um, an asshole. Yeah. I mean, and, you and I have both, both uh, experienced parents who were narcissists. And uh, again, it kind of throws that black cloud over us now. It's like, oh, well, we use the word narcissist. So, you know, anything that you and I may have gone through is immediately, uh, I guess, dismissed because people are overusing these words. Yeah. And that's when I guess you can end up finding your real people, too, because people are overusing these things and. It pushes people like you and me into this weird little corner of, I, I just won't say anything. Yeah. Exactly. But that's because it's not being heard and people are overusing things and it just makes it to where it's becoming shallow, shallow. Yeah. And ours is, was never shallow. It was very deep and full of a lot of waves that were dragging really? us under. It wasn't something that, you know, when it takes you a really long time to actually just admit that someone was being narcissistic and they were being abusive, like that's because it was real. If it's too easy for you to throw it out there, it's probably not. Like, like for example, um, for the longest time, I never, never knew that I was being abused by either parents. And, you know, of course, that word, again, is thrown out there so often that it just it never felt like it pertained to me until I started talking to my therapist. And when I started sharing with Jess, I'm like, you know, I don't know if I was being mentally abused. I don't know if there was emotional abuse. And she was like, there's absolutely abuse there. And when you can acknowledge the things that you're saying are not to say that there isn't truth behind what you're saying, or I guess how you're feeling, but again, education on what X, Y, Z is, you don't just throw out, words of the alphabet and be like oh yeah that's what i have and it's self-diagnosing self-diagnosing is more, more dangerous than understanding what the hell you're going through yeah and, you know i don't just say that i have depression i don't just say that i'm feeling suicidal because if you throw those labels on yourself sure you might you might believe those things but are you feeling this or are you feeling sad and i i feel sad and depression is something that people need to understand the difference between because again common topic here stigma yeah definitely um so this is a question i wrote on here um because i wasn't really sure how how it's determined so how is the autism uh spectrum determined and, and if you're spe uh, feeling comfortable on speaking on it of course where do you and Zane fall on the spectrum? Well, he's still little, so we don't know really where he falls on it yet, okay. other than the fact that um, 
he is a little mentally immature and emotionally immature and being immature doesn't mean the same thing as it was like it would be in a different environment yeah. of it's just you know a little lower the cognitive skills are a lot lower okay it's very hard to get him like he says i am four years old because it's a routine that i taught him but if i ask him how old are you he just repeats how old are you he doesn't know <laughs> Right. what i'm asking him <laughs> but he knows routines like i showed him what it means to open the door close the door so he'll be like open door please and it's funny because i don't know why he sounds so jersey when he says it but he really does <laughs> for me i know that i was told my whole life that i was ocd but you know how how so many people will say that they're ocd Right. To where it just, again, became a thing where it just doesn't mean anything. It's empty because it's overused. But I found out that I am. I just thought that I was kind of a neat freak. But it is a very obsessive thing that I do where, like, my closet, all of my clothes are color coordinated. And they go by size. And then I have a different section that's like, this is where dresses are. And I can't have... um mismatched hangers so my husband has black hangers and they can't be on my side because they don't match and I have different sections to where things go even in my cabinets and they have to religiously obsessively go there um I have to have the labels facing forward and it's not even just that kind of stuff there are weird habits that I do I found out that I'm naturally doing something called the tapping method. Is, um, that, like, is that like nerves or what, what is the tapping method? It's something that I just thought was like calming and soothing to like tap myself in different areas because I thought that it was like a good sensation and it made me refocus Interesting. and I've been doing it forever and I didn't realize that there was that was a thing and then there's a certain way that you can do it and it's really nice but hmm. I also know um we're kind of looking into a little bit more because I do have the auditory processing disorder and they think it's somewhere between Asperger's mostly mm -hmm. they think I might have a little bit of something called canner syndrome which makes it to where my mobile skills are like like I told you, like when we were on the phone last week, mm -hmm. I did that thing where I spilled my drink everywhere because I had like these massive hand spasms right. out of nowhere. Or I'm writing something and then my brain's like, let's throw the pen all the way across the room. <laughs> and yeah, it's just things like that. Um, we're just still trying to learn a lot of things. I think that it's never really going to be narrowed down because it's just so hard to tell what's normal and what's a little different right um i know that another part of the ocd that's on the spectrum is i have um, an obsessive thing with numbers i constantly see and i will have to point it out to somebody like it's just this need i have to do it where it's 3 33 p.m it's 2 22 p.m i have to do that at all times mm -hmm. and repetitive numbers that's interesting. A lot of different, uh, a lot of different uh, aspects to to OCD and to uh, to everything. That's <laughs> I, I know for me, um, and, and like you said, OCD just kind of has been overused and uh, just kind of, I guess, bottomless or yeah, just like no meaning to it anymore. Um, I know for me, I. I think it's my nerves. I know I have pretty, I'm very fidgety. Like I, I can't ever stay still. Um, all my movies for the longest time were alphabetically ordered. And now they're not because I think I just kind of gave up. Um, Mine used to be alphabetically too, but having to shift them so much because yeah, I'm obsessed with buying exactly. movies is so hard. It's so bad. I hate it. Um and there then, actually is still a system I have with mine where I have a different binders full of them and they go in genres now. Nice. Yeah. 
Jesus, oh my God. <laughs> but the genres, I would have like 20 binders. Um, and then- That's why I have so many. <laughs> And then like everything volume related, I always have to have it on an even number. I can't go above or below. Like it always has to be even, like no matter what. And if somebody yeah. screws with the radio and I know it does it, they do it on purpose. Um, I always have to change it because it makes me so mad and I don't know why. Yeah, that's that might actually be a sign of OCD because I do yeah. the same thing. I have to have it on, like there has to be even numbers unless it's an increment of five. Right. Because somehow 25 in my brain is still even. Right. <laughs> because it's in fives. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> um, so this is this is a, a question I wrote on here because I know I love your passion for mental health. And honestly, you're one of my favorite people when it comes to talking about stuff like this because you and I can bounce off of each other for hours on this subject. But <laughs> we do. <laughs> How how has your passion with mental health helped you bring, uh, oh God, I'm using this word again, I apologize, awareness <laughs> and advocate acceptance, there we go, for, for autism? I think that spending years just being that weirdo that was like so nerdy and so passionate on this is what these things mean, guys, like, have you known that this person might not be a narcissist. This person actually might have a personality disorder, a histrionic personality disorder that makes them a little bit wild and self-centered. There are so many different types. And then I ended up kind of narrowing it down a little bit more to autism because it was starting to feel a little insulting to mm -hmm. be having my son compared as if he's has Down syndrome and I don't think there's anything wrong either with Down syndrome. It's just there are very different things. And yeah, I mean, somebody who has insomnia doesn't want to be told that they are something completely different, like that completely, I don't know, deletes what they really are but in a way that doesn't help them. I just can't think of what the opposite of insomnia would be. An aha, like a narcolepsy, right? A narcolepsy, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like they're so wildly different that that doesn't even make any sense to confuse those two. Sorry, it took me a second to remember what that was. Um, I would have never I, guessed it. So I'm glad you did. <laughs> every time I try to share something that teaches people about autism, like just the information, the, like the little charts that I sent, it clears up a lot of misconceptions and I'm so into doing that because I love getting messages and I know I'm bad at the messages. I will check these though, because they like light bulb me in a way and they're going, they have so many questions and I can see that I just ignited a passion in them and I can see these people are now going to start diving into Google and picking up the phone and going, Oh my God. I'm autistic too. That's crazy. Cause right. yeah, there's so many different types and it's not really different levels. It's different types in my opinion. And I know like Brian, Brian had no idea. He didn't think so. And then I remember I was talking about it a lot a few years ago and he was kind of like, I think I am too. How would I know this? And I was like, it's just something that you have to learn about it because everyone's different. So he even still he asked me a few days ago this really funny odd question of if my brain freezes when you have to sneeze and I was like absolutely like man down <laughs> we're all done until I'm done sneezing I nothing else exists and I even shared with him this story about a friend of mine I, she knew I had this fear because you know some people sneeze like with their eyes closed and their whole body freezes yeah. I had a fear of sneezing while driving and it had never happened to me before so the day that I felt it coming on because I didn't have a window in Arizona with all that dust everywhere I screamed really squeaky very loudly Jesus take the wheel during the sneeze because it was a very dramatic loud sneeze too <laughs> And she was so scared about the, the over theatrics of that genuine fear that she, I don't know why, but she smacked her head on the window. 
Like, what were you planning on doing? Like, escaping through the window? That doesn't make any sense. Yeah. But I don't have a fear of that anymore because I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Um, and he he cracks me up too because he's taught me new terms and even though he's newer into learning about this stuff he's still teaching me certain things too and um, like that's I guess that's why we both dive deep into certain things we don't just like things we obsess yeah. those things become our entire personality and we have to know every single little intricate detail of whatever it is that we're interested in at that time and he calls it ADHD when it's like an autistic ADHD moment. Right. And then I officially, because of him, I refer to it as the tism. I'm like, ah, that's just the tism. <laughs> I think I remember you saying that to me on, uh, on Messenger. <laughs> oh, yeah. He said it once and I was like, that's it. That's, that's the one. Great. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a good one for you. Um, only because I know we've been talking about this specific word uh, most of the podcast. What is the biggest misconception or stigma about autism? It's not a disorder. That's why I think it's so, it's not a disease. It's not a disorder. It doesn't make us dumb. It doesn't make us like really any different. We are just different types of thinkers where we are very behind in other places that I guess your average person would be good at or would thrive in, but then we thrive in ways that other people can't seem to grasp. Hmm. I think a lot of people who are autistic are because it swings so wildly I think they're either going to be the most logical people or they're going to be the most creative people. Which is funny because with me, what I've seen is that there doesn't really seem to be an in-between. Right. It's either one or the, or, uh, one or the other. Yeah. Um, I mean, we're not mentally handicapped. We're not sick. We're not slow. We are brilliant weirdos. Yeah, and, and I'm not really... I think people who are autistic are also probably some of the kindest people that you'll ever meet because we are so full of joy and learning and empathy. So we don't really take things as you're hurting us. So we must be against you. We're not so dramatic. Like what I see your average person is kind of like, we're more yeah. like you're upset or you're angry I want to be able to get to the bottom of who you are individually and why that upset you. So I know how to help you so I can put a smile back on your face. Right. That's what I see. Go ahead. Uh, that's just what I see is the most common in anybody who is autistic is that they are just so kind. They just love being happy and they love other people being happy. Yeah, and, and I really, I really appreciate how you highlighted that it's not a disease and that we don't need a cure uh, for it because it's, it should be treated as, as a normal person with a superpower. I mean, that's basically what it is. I mean, logic and cre uh, logical or creative people. I mean, you're ahead in one area. Sure, you may be behind another, but I mean, either way, you're finding that massive success in your you're functioning as somebody else would just in different areas. So yeah. I and that's what I meant by it's normal is that like, when you think about that and you go, we may be ahead in other areas and behind in others, but who does that not apply to? Yeah. <clears throat> um, so what are some ways that you practice uh, self-care to get through your weeks? Cause I know with your schedule between the kids and with work, I mean, I, I know you're genuinely pretty busy and you have your schedule, but like, what does self-care look like for you? Uh, learning. My self-care is, it's, I am very nerdy and I've always been. I think that's something that you and I first bonded over, but I love learning a whole lot of stuff. Um, I love reading. 
Um, I they, Whenever I learn things and I'm reading, I just feel this new spark and it completely ignites me and it makes me feel alive again when I'm learning different things. Um, you know, I love working on cars and I love rebuilding them. I love gardening. Um, Zane and I both are very, very big swimming lovers. Like if we are inside, I think it's a texture thing because yeah. texture is very big for people on the spectrum. And we love being in the water. That feeling is just so therapeutic. And there's, I love art, so I don't really display it, but I draw and I paint and you do know that I write. Yeah. And I'm truthfully, I'm just like, my self-care is also trying to just keep my inner child alive. Yeah. So Zane and I both together on the playground, we both go on the slides. We both <laughs> go on the swings. We both play the basketball in the front yard and we both climb things and climb trees. And uh, we seek all these different adventures. Like we go fishing and, you know, those times that I go off and I chase down and try to play photographer and right. take really cool pictures. It's just, we, I just, my self-care is just trying to find a way to have fun because I love having fun. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, you know, I definitely feel like that's an under, uh, underrated um, concept of self-care. It's like, you know, people usually think it's just writing or it's just listening to music. And like you said, having fun. I mean, that's what self-care is all about. It's taking care of yourself and making sure that not only are you recharging yourself, but you're also, uh, you know, buying stuff for yourself, going to the spa, going to the gym, whatever it is. Self-care doesn't all look the same, but it's all chasing the same objective. It's taking care of that inner child that may be bruised or it could be taking care of the adult that's trying to get through that fire, trying to get through those, uh, um, I guess, struggles that they have gone through that week. Yeah, and I didn't get to have like a whole lot of fun as a kid. I was never really allowed to go sleep over anywhere or go to the movies with friends or do anything. I had to be supervised like at all times and it felt very isolating. So yeah. now that I don't have to really be like that anymore, I go and I just have fun. And I want Zane to see too that, you know, just because you're an adult doesn't mean you have to be boring. You know, right. your life and your fun is not over. You obviously get your work done, do the things that you're supposed to do, be a good person, but go have fun. The amount of times that I've been told in my life that I don't know how to relax seems a little weird to me just because I'm running around and I'm playing or I'm being very goofy while I'm cooking. It doesn't mean I'm not relaxing. That is how I relax. Feeling good and having fun is how I relax. Yeah, Laying sure. down... And doing nothing to me just seems like that's recharging and resting, not really relaxing. Right. Yeah, that's that's why I was joking around with uh with Vince. You saw on his status where he's like, uh, you need to be up at 7 a.m. for a barbecue. I'm like, I don't know, man. I, I treasure <laughs> myself more than I like people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um no. <laughs> no, thank you Absolutely to the 7 a.m. Every time someone, but you know, I have a sleeping disorder too. So I right. try really hard to stick to my schedule no matter what. I don't care if I have a day off. Um, because if I take that as like, I break my schedule because I have a day off, then I'm taking, I'm spending the next two weeks trying to bring it back just because that one time and right. it's not worth it to me. And when I don't have to wake up until like, technically I don't have to until eight. Zane doesn't wake up before then. Um, sometimes I just wake up at six naturally and I have like a whole life before I make this joke a lot to my boss before he even gets out of bed. Right. Like I'll show him I did the dishes. I did laundry. I went, I got coffee. I got my kid ready. I went and took, I went to a car wash. I had a whole life before you got up, man. And on the other side of that, hearing that other people have to get up like at four or five in the morning I'm like that's disgusting <laughs> yeah I uh I don't do good with getting up early um I 
am not exaggerating when I say I have like eight alarms to make mm -hmm. sure that I get up and they're all within like 30 to 45 minute difference between each other. Um, wow. Yeah, it's, it's bad. And somebody that I was talking to at, at some point, uh, I told her, I said, uh, just to be, just to warn you, cause I have work tomorrow. You're going to hear like seven alarms. And she just kind of like brushed it off. I'm like, yeah, okay. You got seven alarms. You probably only have two, but exaggerating. Oh no. She found out the hard way. <laughs> the first one at like seven o'clock and she just kind of went back to sleep. And then like 7.45 and 8, 8.30. And it's like, all right, you need to get up. This is ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I have, I think this is part of the, the tism, but I have three alarms for the morning. I abide by them. I have them labeled so immaturely. I'll text you later <laughs> what they are. I don't think I should say it in here, but when my first one goes off, I do get up. I comply because like I said, my routine is my religion. So right. I do get up. The other alarms are just to keep me on track to know what I need to do next. It's to keep me organized and scheduled. And I know exactly what time I need to be walking at the door based off of certain traffic so I can get to work on time and have enough time to do certain things. And right. I am never late. <laughs> I, uh, my first alarm is wake up Wade. So my Bixby alarm reads all my headlines for my alarms. And then <laughs> the next one after that is wake up asshole. Um, <laughs> I have so many insults on my alarms. Mm -hmm. I eventually wake up to <laughs> and then have my uh separate alarm clock that has a that plays the radio um right along with my phone alarm so yeah it's it's always a good time in my house <laughs> yeah I think some of mine's like seriously get it together man facts absolute facts <laughs> for, for those of you listening yes I do not wake up um, I don't blame so, you you do so much stuff and you juggle a million things and you're up until like I don't know two or three in the morning still yeah. making sure that you take care of all these different platforms and watch all make sure everyone's doing okay I am not like that I am like no I took my sleep meds at 9 30 I shouldn't be allowed to have my phone on. after that like I said it a couple months ago to my therapist I think uh I said to Jess, I'm like, I don't think people realize how much energy that I put into this. And not not that it's I don't want to put in that energy. It's just like I overextend myself so much sometimes that I don't realize I'm doing it until I get to the point where I have been for the last two weeks of not posting anything, not sharing anything, not giving anybody any updates. And just I needed to completely unplug from everything. And people don't realize how exhausting it is being there for people. Like I have no problem being there for a random person on the side of the street, being there for, for you, being there for uh, Judy, being there for Caleb, whoever it is. And that's just who I am because I didn't have that growing up, but I don't think people will truly appreciate how much time and effort that I do put aside for, for this group. I mean, I'd probably say, 99% of my energy goes goes towards mental health related stuff. And I have noticed that because I notice people thriving in the things that I am terrible at. So it's something that I end up, if I end up admiring it and I want to be better at it, it's like I'm studying it. And that's why I have so many questions for you all the time. Because all I do is just like answer people in my inbox a lot. Cause I feel like that's a, personal responsibility like a job that yeah. I dedicated myself to but then I don't talk to the people who are actually in my life and then I see that you're running your own group and then you run this podcast and then you have it on TikTok and on YouTube and then you know you still have different fandoms and stuff that you run and then there's like the Twitter and then you have oh yeah you have the mental health thing on um Instagram and then you have your own personal stuff too and it's just like wow I and then, don't and then even bring my phone to the bathroom. <laughs> and then on top of that, trying to like squeeze in the the little uh I can never say this word right, so I'm gonna butcher it. The new nuances? Is that how you say it? Yeah, nuance, yeah. 
Yeah, and then like trying to squeeze in like uh, my Monday and Friday routines with music. And sometimes I go a whole day without listening to music. And when I get to the end of that day, it's like, shit, I didn't listen to anything all day. And my brain is scrambled because of it. And uh, sometimes they'll go like weeks without watching movies. And I know people that may be listening are kind of confused. I'm like, who cares if you're not watching movies? But like growing up, movies were my escape. You know, movies Mm -hmm. were something that took my hand and brought me through so many different journeys and so many different universes that it helped me get through my parents' divorce. It helped me get through my attempts, you know, whatever it was. And now that I don't want to say it was a codependency. Movies weren't a codependency, but it was a strong coping tool for me for a very long time. Yeah, it's almost like it was a remedy. Yeah, exactly. And now that I'm in therapy, you know, therapy is the strongest coping tool that I have because she gives me uh, different insights on things that I'm struggling with. You know, like I don't feel comfortable enough talking about on this podcast, but, you know, my last conversation about therapy in the group, um, yeah. that post, I, I kid you not, Kate, I, I've never felt that ex- mentally exhausted in my life until I shared that that post with everybody. Um, Which is understandable so- because you're yeah. putting a lot of pressure and shame, but you're trying to force through that to face some bravery and to that that can see how that would be exhausting and it would burn you out because the roller coaster of emotions very deep emotions you would have to go through in order to even post that yeah and to convince yourself to do it is just yeah it's intense and you know i'm very open on speaking about my journey and everything right yeah uh, when I had that conversation with Jess, you know, that's how I started off our session. Uh, I said, you know, something I've been wanting to talk to you about for a while, and I didn't know how to even begin to talk about it. Because again, there's that stigma behind men, regardless of mental health and everything that we do is under a, you know, a constant magnifying glass, anything we say, anything we feel, whatever. I threw myself into a full-blown panic attack because I told her I didn't know how to talk about it I started talking about it the second I got there I was on a cliff and I threw myself off of it and just like hyperventilating because I didn't know how to how to say this to a woman who happens to be my therapist and Jess when you do listen to this podcast uh, I'm sure it'll be before our session but I am endlessly grateful for that session you made probably one of the biggest differences in my life after after that session so again thank you but um yeah that that post took so much energy out of me and I wasn't expecting anybody to respond to be honest with you and you responding of all people meant the world to me because I know you're not a judgmental person at all but I just I felt like there was going to be heavy judgment from like everybody like regardless of who they are to me yeah, I think that's because there's such like there's such a bad thing against men and there's way too much pressure to overcorrect things that yeah. you as an individual were never even guilty of. Right. So it just seems so crazy that like all these people are going to end up labeling all these nasty things onto something that is so normal. Right. So um, I I can't understand it. And I just want to end up saying that, like, to all those people that are causing this kind of shame in people, I just want to tell them, just shut up. <laughs> I could have said it any better. <laughs> <laughs> um, so before I ask this question, uh, for all my listeners, uh, as you already know, we talk about heavy subjects on here. And I'm just going to throw a trigger warning out there because I know Caitlin gave me a heads up on it. And uh this being the final question, it is the heaviest part of today's recording. So just a trigger warning for those who are going to be tuning in. Um, so this last question for you, Kate, is what is one thing you wish you can improve in the mental health community? I think being informed about what things are, where they stem from, how to heal, 
all of those things, I think that those should be a mandatory thing that everyone learns about. Obviously, I think it should be handled in an age appropriate way, but I think that we should start trying to teach certain things as quickly as possible so we understand things like don't remove information and education about puberty from the school system that is so important because not all parents are educated on how to teach that stuff. Teachers are educated on how to teach that stuff. So there should be some kind of involvement too to teach children about normal things that they might actually very realistically experiencing, whether it's something that they have themselves or it's something that their loved ones will have in the future or even when they have them now. Because when I was little, uh, my uncle was very schizophrenic. He had it very badly. I didn't know anything about it. I honestly thought that he was just like this magical fairy that could see things that I couldn't. I thought he had a, some kind of possession. Some part of me still believes that too. But if you don't have any information and any education on these things, like the differences in different bipolar disorders versus borderline personality disorders, other personality disorders, ADHD, autism, you're not learning about any of that stuff. So you don't know how to live with any of it. And it creates impatience and struggles. And honestly, this is the hard part. If there were better education, then there would, I believe there would be so many less suicides and homicides because when people are educated, they know what to do to heal themselves or they know the signs to look out for to help save someone's life because someone lost complete control, didn't take their medication, and their mind is in a completely different phase now. They are no longer who they are, and they end up losing control. Like, I want to say there was a guy who played um, Half Sack in Sons of Anarchy. He was also the drummer, I think, in Drake and Josh, and you know, he's a bunch of other things. And mm -hmm. I think he had some kind of like bipolar two disorder, maybe with like a schizoaffective thing attached to it. But I read that he killed himself and killed somebody else and killed a cat, I think is what I read, because I was like, why a cat too? Like trying to understand what happened there. And right. if there were proper education on it, that probably could have been prevented. Also, substance abuse people are without realizing it they're trying to self-soothe they're trying to self-medicate and correct things that really therapy could help or maybe taking a prescription can help and there's no shame in taking prescriptions no one shames anybody for wearing glasses it's not right. their fault that they can't see so it's not anybody's fault that their chemicals are a little imbalanced and I just don't think that there should be so many hoops to jump through to take care of mental health. Why can you go and easily get a gym membership and go to the gym whenever you want, but you can't seem to, it takes years for you to get into therapy. Right. That's just, seems like something that should be equally important, especially since really your mentality can completely corrupt your physical. Absolutely. And people, People underestimate that too when they just say, oh, go to the gym, you'll feel better. And it's, it's, you know, I know there's benefits to working out. I know there's all those chemicals and stuff that will be introduced into your brain when you exercise. But depression is one of those things where, you know, it's not, it's not a crutch like people try to make it sound. You know, depression is not something I could just shut off and be like, oh, yeah, I feel great. I'm going to the gym. It doesn't work that way. And again, it falls under what you just said, you know, education on all these things would be incredible. Like the only thing I could say I genuinely took out of high school was psychology class when they talked about grief, like the five stages of grief is literally the only thing I took out of that class. And only because he showed us a robot chicken video on, on grief. And <laughs> as funny as that sounds, when you go back and watch that video, like, Believe it or not, I've sent that video to to Keisha when uh, Santi passed away. I, I've sent it to a couple people. I'm like, you know, I know Robot Chicken is known for those ha ha's. We're gonna make fun of everybody kind of thing, but it has a very interesting 
take on grief because it uses a giraffe that gets stuck in quicksand and it shows the different stages of grief. I'm like, that's something I wish I was taught better in. And I, I know I said it in my last podcast, but I wish grief was taught in schools and yes. education on, on mental illnesses, because yes, you can give me a book definition of what depression is. I feel depression. I don't need a damn book to tell me what I feel. And if these teachers or therapists or psychologists, whatever, uh, I feel like the resources are missing. The funding is missing. Like there, there's so many broken things in this system that drives these people to take their life or drive people to the point of wanting to take another person's life because we just live in a world where everything's put under a magnifying glass and everybody's getting canceled for something and you can't hear truths from either side because you don't know who's telling you the truth anymore. And yeah, and then there's also so much pressure that everything has to be instant. Right. And that's the biggest problem is uh, we live in a society of instant gratification. If we if everything isn't done right this second, you see riots, you see people burning cities down, you, you see, you know, people... You know, I hate to throw this out there, but you see the you see the shootings that are going crazy, you know, and it breaks my heart to see the state that we're in in this country right now because compassion is missing, kindness is missing, understanding is completely missing, and you know, it, it all falls down to our leaders. Our, our leaders aren't doing anything, and I'm sorry to get any kind of political, but the last two weeks I've been stirring on this, and I feel this was the appropriate time to speak on it without like putting any beliefs out there, of course, and talking with somebody as understanding as you are. Yeah. I mean, honestly, whether people like it or not, this system is not working and it could be reorganized. It could be restructured and it could be fine. A lot right. of these problems really are based off of a lack of desire to learn and a lack of, resources to be able to learn this stuff. I exactly. mean, if we actually had some kind of proper education on coping and healing and grief and like if you be if you do become addicted to something, how can you fight that? I mean, yeah. if we actually had real life lessons being taught to us, then by professionals and like as children too, we could all understand each other so much more we could have more patience with each other and everyone would actually know how to get along a little bit better right but and no one's really getting along because everyone believes that you should be exactly like how they are right and there there's so many people on both sides that just can't accept that other people may have other views and throwing things in each other's face and saying oh well it's your fault this happened no it's your fault it's your fault and while we're sitting here blaming blaming each other and pointing fingers at each other and saying that what you believe in isn't right or what I believe in isn't right. There's still people out there taking their life because they're just sitting here waiting for somebody to give a shit. And, you know, the first time I attempted, you know, I was 14. I've shared this story a million times. And the, the resource I got was two weeks, uh, two days of outpatient therapy with a gambling addict counselor. Now, let that sink in. I tried taking my life, and the resource I was given was a gambling uh, addiction therapist. And I was 14 years old. What the hell am I going to be gambling besides my life? You know? You know, and there's like expressions like apples and oranges. And then mm -hmm. I like to say, but there's still fruit. Yep. But in that scenario, that is like apples and pencils. Exactly. That, that has nothing to do with each other and that can't be a place to help you. And, you know, not, uh, I'll never, you know, make excuses for my mother being the way that she is, but they weren't given resources either when they were growing up. You know, they gave her Xanax to help her with their anxiety. And, and if she's off of it, she goes into a full blown panic attack and all these other medicines that she's taking. And now you can see it physically wearing her down. Is there a part of me that feels bad to see her this way? Sure. But 
all in all, she wasn't given resources to get help for herself and anything toxic that she had in her personality, she poured out onto me. So, you know. Yeah, it's good to have a good juggle of understanding versus not accepting where yeah. while I can understand that that was a generation that was being told to suck it up and rub some dirt on it and constantly saying to grow a pair yep. all those things that just don't make any sense there does also come a time where you are an adult and you are responsible for your own actions 1, there's a point where you cannot blame anybody else anymore like they shouldn't have just because they didn't have those resources doesn't mean that there was anyone stopping them from trying. Yeah. I mean, the Google has been accessible and awesome for almost our whole lives. Well, at least to me, because yeah. I didn't pay attention. I didn't know what a computer was until I was a lot older, but still I, there was constant ways that you can learn and better yourself. So at some point they need to be held responsible too, for choosing to not get better. Exactly. And I do actually want to say that there are some moments where I think the whole suck it up, rub some dirt in it is good. Absolutely. But, I mean, you shouldn't do it in moderation. You shouldn't live by it. Yeah, like, for example, if you see your kid, you know, fall down and not break something, you know, like scrape their knee, the instant reaction shouldn't be freaking out. It's like, oh, uh, get back up, you're okay, kind of thing, like. You don't need to, uh, I guess, baby everybody. Not baby. That that's that's insensitive of me to say it like that. But like, I guess, hover over our kids to make yeah, sure. Yeah, like coddling. The world doesn't. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, because I mean, I don't know if you've seen this or anything, but like, small children when they fall and they get hurt, they immediately before they even react, unless they're in a, a lot of pain and it's very real pain. Yeah. They're just scared, and instead of reacting, they immediately look for their parent, and they go based off their parent's reaction. Exactly. So if the parent is constantly like <gasps> running up to you, are you okay? You're okay. It doesn't matter. You just gasped, and you just taught them that their fear is very real, and that turns them into very anxious people. And you don't want that. You want them to become people that understand this sucks, but is it actually a problem? Exactly. But we have come to the part of the podcast where I'd like to read a quote um, that I find on whatever subject that I happen to be covering. Um, today, I found one um, from Autism to Yoga, and I thought this was a very beautifully written piece uh, by Miss Elizabeth, uh, I'm going to butcher her last name, Kubler or Kubler Ross. Um, and it reads, the most beautiful people we have known are those who have known defeat. Uh, known suffering, known struggle, known loss, and have found their way out of depths. These, pers these persons have an appreciation, a sensitivity, and an understanding of life that fills them with compassion, gentleness, and a deep loving concern. Beautiful do not, beautiful people do not just happen. Yeah, I do love that. Yeah, I, I thought you would like it. I, like I said, I kind of went down a rabbit hole of different quotes and kind of found those like backhanded oh this sounds great and then you read the end it's like well shit <laughs> yeah there are just a lot of backhanded compliments yeah um, so I like that that one was like that one is can be applied to anybody but exactly. it is still very true for what autistic people have to face with the I don't know ill-informed society right um I just wanted to uh, make a quick shout to all my uh, listeners. Thank you again for your constant support. Um, and just as a reminder, on May the 5th, I believe it's at 7.30. I got to double check the time. I will be on a panel for men's mental health um, with, with NAMI. Um, so I look forward to seeing people on there. So far, we have about 19 signups and would love to get more. Um, and again, thank you guys so much for listening. Caitlin, thank you so much for being on this podcast. This was great. Yeah, thanks for having me. I love that it had to be with the, during the uh, Autism Acceptance Month. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and for all my listeners, uh, make sure you like, share, and subscribe. You can find me on Spotify, iTunes, and YouTube. Um, and until next time, 
be well, and as always, be gentle with yourselves. Take care.